I'm going to quickly read a poem because uh, I have I have written poems, but in this august setting, uh, kind of thought, yeah, should I read it? Should I not? But I'm going to go ahead and read it. Um, it's called City Lights, uh, named after the bookstore in San Francisco. I used to stop there whenever I got there, maybe once a year, and stock up on books. And for those of you who don't know, Lou Welsh uh, was a beat poet. And um, I had bought his books oh, in, in the early 70s, I guess, really loved them. And I went back a few years later and, and got some more books. City Lights. New crop of books from old friends. I read in Gary's poem that Lou Welsh shot himself. I didn't know. This happened decades ago, but I will always think of him as a young man whose mind is much like mine. The things of this world, tiny innumerable cogs, slip together in their inexplicable geometry of perfection. Poets can see these particles. Gary's poems have that feeling like mine that the most excellent and the most precise is just a realization that our most casual thoughts are poems. We round up the lines as if they were birds in the sparrow net of consciousness. In that bamboo cage of defining thought, they are displayed, food for those who come to the marketplace. Some pay a piece of silver, open the door, and take one home. But another, perhaps Lou Welsh, doesn't bother to pay. In pale clothes, eating his breakfast, an orange, he wanders through the square, shortly after dawn, waiting for his fellow artists to wake from their late night and join him. In the damp square which glitters in the sun, banks of cut flowers flank the sparrow cage. He finishes his orange, re wipes his hands on his pants, reaches out, and sets the sparrows free. In War Times, um, takes place, it, it starts uh, on um, um, the, the night before Pearl Harbor, and it goes through to the, about the 60s. And uh, I'm just gonna read a little excerpt. And uh, to bring it up to date, the main character, who is not my father, but who uh, is writing the memoirs in, in, the, in the book, um, which my father helped edit and, and shape for the book, um, is at Aberdeen, and uh, he's, um, he's met this strange physicist from Hungary who has given him the plans for a device that she says will change the warlike nature of human beings, except that it's not actually built yet, and she doesn't know whether or not it will work. But uh, he's at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, and he meets Al Winkelmeyer, uh, and they find out that they both like jazz, which is not unusual for that time since it was the music of the age. And they um, decide to take off for New York one weekend to listen to jazz. They take their instruments with them. They got the last available room at the Y, grabbed a beer and a bite to eat, then headed to 52nd Street. The marquees were blacked out, but there was still enough light from cars and windows to read sandwich boards arrayed down the street, heralding one jazz luminary after another. Sam felt the rush of liberation and excitement that a city always gave him, a sense of intense, profligate possibilities. Wink whistled. Let us pray. This must be heaven. Tea Garden. Hawkins. Eckstein. Over the next few hours, they kept up a frantic pace, moving from one tiny club to the next, buying as few exorbitantly priced drinks as possible. When Red, Red Norvo took a break, they dashed across 52nd Street to catch Lester Young and Coleman Hawkins in a cutting contest. Hawkins deep and moody, with perfect unexpected pauses, young with a lighter, more facile approach, a virtuoso freeing a melody exactly when it needed to be liberated into a present of wild notes strung together with the barest of connections. The audiences were exclusively white, as was usual in upscale venues. Sam was no stranger to racism. No one in America was. His parents were strangely free of it, but all towns and cities had their black and white side of the tracks. In North Carolina, at Camp, Camp Sutton, he had seen it head on in their forays to town. Black and white drinking fountains were labeled, and when he tried to talk to the band members at one of the jazz tours that came through town, he was confronted afterwards in the parking lot by a band of lo local vigilantes with sticks who warned him not to fraternize and tell his soldier friends the same. He didn't have to. Most of the other soldiers in Company C shared this attitude. By that time, He'd spent, already spent the past six years on the other side of the tracks, listening, and was more used to the obverse, 
the foray into black territory in the after hours joints on the other side of the tracks. He'd never been physically threatened in those instances, though, as he had been in North Carolina. But even here in New York City, it seemed that blacks were discouraged from mixing with white audiences, though he thrilled to spot Coleman Hawkins, whom they had seen on stage earlier at a club across the street an hour earlier, sipping a beer and listening with deep concentration to a subtle witty saxophone duel couched in a big band setting. At the early hour of 1 a.m., they found themselves out on the street pleasantly buzz. So, where's your sit-in place, asked Sam. Mittens. It's in a hotel at Harlem. You don't need a union card there. All the musicians jam there. I was there a few months ago and saw Cab Calloway and a pretty damn good singer, young girl, Sarah Vaughan, thin as a stick. Didn't dare try to play, but we might get up there for a minute or two before we get kicked off. Which train, asked Sam with a grin. The quickest one, of course, replied Dwink, deadpan. Take the A Train, written by Billy Strayhorn, had recently been a big hit for Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington. The words were ostensibly based on Ellington's directions to Strayhorn on how to get to Harlem. Mittens was tiny, and many of the handkerchief-sized tables were taken. Sam and Wink found seats right next to the stage and ordered a beer apiece. The place smelled of long-vanished fried chicken and cigarette smoke. The piano player assayed halting entire chords, violently augmented or flatted, linked by the trumpet's fleeting expressionistic runs. The drummer intrigued Sam. He used all four limbs independently to produce near melodic lines with his various percussives. The bass player wore an expression of deep concentration, plucking notes from within what seemed an entirely different timeline from the other musicians. The fractured music formed a fascinating entirety. Who's playing, Wink asked the waiter in a loud whisper, breaking the strange, complete quiet of the listeners. Several people turned and frowned at him. The waiter leaned close. Guy named Thelonious Monk. Oh, I'm sorry, Thelonious Sphere Monk. Pettiford on bass, Kenny Clark on drums, Dizzy Gillespie on trumpet. Another musician pushed his way past their table, holding his music case overhead. Sax, said Sam approvingly, as the man stepped on stage, opened his case, and slipped the strap over his head. That's Bird. The bird guy wore a soiled t-shirt, a fancy black overcoat with a fur collar and sunglasses. The wrinkles in his pants were accentuated by the single brilliant spotlight illuminating the small dingy stage where the grand piano and drums took up so much room that the rest of the players barely had space to stand. The band swung into a number so fast it was indeed dizzying, accompanied by shouts from the audience, play it man, that's it. Apparently silence did not reign during fast numbers. Strange, remarked Sam. Wink's eyes were closed. After a moment, he said, flatted fifths, start and stop anywhere. The spoken phrase, salt peanuts, salt peanuts, was repeated several times, separated by a beat that kept Sam strangely unbalanced, along with the oct octave jump between salt and pea. When the salt peanuts piece was over, another trumpeter climbed onto the stage. Dizzy looked at him and smiled in a predatory way. All right, then, sweet Georgia Brown, A flat seventh counted out the beat. The new trumpeter frowned for a few bars, not even blowing. Finally, he kicked in with a few notes. They were in the wrong key. Shamefaced, he climbed down. Dizzy stopped blowing for a moment to smile once again. This time, Sam saw satisfaction in that smile. The strange key, the challenge, was a t way of testing aspiring players. Pettiford and Monk left around three, but Bird and Diz seemed oblivious to their absence. Bird, eyes closed, face glistening with sweat, leaned back and let loose with something entirely new in the world, a long, wild phrase that Diz promptly echoed without a mistake. In the middle, in what seemed the middle of a lightning fast unison run, they stopped abruptly. Parker squinted against the glare of the spotlight. Those instruments I see there, boys? You bet, Wink said. Come on up and play. If you can, was the unspoken dare, almost a jeer familiar to Sam and apparently to Wink as well. Though completely out of their league in this new land of utterly unique music, they hurriedly unpacked their instruments. Sam counted yet a point in Wink's favor that he was quite as eager to, as Sam to make a fool of himself. Bird swung into something he said was body and soul, D, but which after the first introductory bar bore only a passing resemblance to the original, which Hawkins had already revolutionized. Parker suddenly put down his horn, ambled into a dark corner, shrugged off his coat, whipped off his tie, and tightened it around his arm. Hell, Diz grumbled. 
he stopped playing as well, dropped onto the piano bench and wiped his forehead with a white handkerchief. Sam and Wink began a dialogue. It was the first time they had ever played together. Sam lost himself in the naked liniments of pure, timeless tone. Wink played himself into what seemed like dead ends and then drew Sam with him over a chasm of skipped chords, which, though unplayed, somehow resonated. Dizzy suddenly regained interest and then Bird, his equilibrium restored, returned and joined Diz in a rapid luminescent flight, leaving the two soldiers in the dust. Afterwards, Sam decided that he had stepped into one of Haddon's perfect worlds and lived a couple of lifetimes there. He and Wink soon brought their conversation to a good stopping point and climbed down from the stage, conceding defeat concurrently. While the audience, now swelled by a new party that had just wandered in, offered ragged applause, probably because he and Wink had given up, Dizzy and Parker swung into something that sounded like Cherokee, except that it was about ten time fast, times faster and was like a roller coaster. And then uh, Mint Minton's closes and um, they ask uh, him, to, they, they ask Sam and Wink to accompany them to uh, Monroe's. Uh, we're heading over to Monroe's, the party's young. On the street, walking through cold drizzle, Wink peppered Dizzy with questions. What do you call the stuff you play? Modern jazz. You didn't do too bad, how's that? Wink said, don't know, I play the violin though. Classical background, music theory, that helps. It sounds like you're doing a lot of augmented thirteenths. Parker, who so far had walked ahead of them, constantly looking up and down the street, turned his head. That's right, ever heard of Stravinsky? Yeah, yeah, in fact. This way, Bird herded them toward a dark alley. Sam balked, and Bird said, you know the military put Harlem off limits to servicemen? He gestured toward a shadowy figure at the end of the block. There's a cop down the street. Sam and Wink followed the jazz men into the shadows while Dizzy said, you owe that guy money, Bird. Aw, oh, shut up. <laughs>